Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. We had to make this a multi uh, episode, multi multiple episode sessions. So yeah. Matt, uh, as if you remember, Matt wound up getting a lot of errors the last time he tried to deploy this, and it's something with the public IP. So we've gotten to that point. Yeah, and I think I think there are so many a uh, couple things here when it comes to like the templates and and item potency and stuff like that, that <clears throat> we might want to fix up. Um, for example, like if you look at our uh, VM name here, like we have VM same VNet name, right? We're naming our VM the same as our VNet. So if we use this template to deploy another VM, it's going to take on the name of the VNet, which means now we're I, deploying uh, another VM. I think it's, I, I don't think, I, I think it's different than the VNet. I just called my project that so that I knew what it was in my local source. Oh, gotcha. That's right. And, and the, but the fact that, you know, at some point we're going to add this as a nested template and have our VM name, um, we should probably think about the naming convention on that. So yeah. like, instead of saying um, same VNet name here, we could say VM same VNet like VM name. Yep. Yeah, 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 exactly. And then, yeah, and then we'll go down and fix up the red, which, which is. So, yeah, so now our Nick is going to get the same name as a VM, except with network interface mm -hmm. uh, to it. And then here is our VM. Okay. And computer name. Okay, so that at least relieves some confusion with. I'm with you on that front. I, I named it that way because of everything I had stored locally. I didn't want to pull the wrong templates to share with you. Got you. Okay, so. so in the confusion. <laughs> yep, so then here we've got to fix up. Um, We've got to fix up the name of the parameter that we're passing in as well. And find that parameter. It might be easier just to search through here. Okay, so we know we're getting a, a unique VM name. And then, okay, so let's control S that. And save this. Okay, and then, okay, so let's address this error. At least one resource deployment operation failed. And it's saying. It looks like it's something related to public IP. And when I looked at the resource group, it's like it. <clears throat> like it gave the existing VM a different public IP. It's really weird. I don't know what uh, happened. Gotcha. Okay. So, um, so here, if we look at to see what public IP, yeah, this is a public IP name here. And actually, what we probably That's a variable, so let's make sure that. Ha. Huh. That's it's probably hard code. That's it's probably what the hard... issue was. I didn't even think about that. So when when you're right clicking inside of Visual Studio, and you start to become more familiar with what you're doing, you may not want to hard code your pip name, for instance. But exactly, and so like like with, 
So what I try to do with naming conventions when I'm creating an ARM template as well, and this is usually more, you put more thought when you're not doing a quick and dirty, right? Um, is I will try to use like some sort of concatenation of the VM name for everything that the VM depends on, right? So the VM depends on the NIC, which depends on the, the IP. So we're gonna, we're gonna do a concatenation here and we're gonna say, uh, we're going to call our pip um, or our public IP, I should say, the same as our um, VM, same VNet VM name. And then we'll just say oh, and here I go with the double quotes again. I keep keep doing that you, you want to use single quotes here because you don't want to close off the double quotes up here right so we use single quotes for a string I'm just too used to coding okay so that's going to name our public IP VM name dash public IP we have our Nick named VM name dash Nick we have um, our VM with the uh, identifying parameter there. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's control S that. And let's just go ahead and see if, uh, first of all, if, if our um, identity session is still here. All right, looks like we're uploading some blobs. And oh yeah, look, it looks like I didn't change it in the parameter file. Let's let's go ahead and do that first. So parameter file, remember I I fixed it in the main template that we're passing in, but I didn't fix it in the param file. Okay. For the VNet name. And see what this is complaining about. Yeah, that's fine. That's right. We were, we were getting that. So that so that one right there, the VM same VNet, that actually is the VNet reference. Maybe that's where this all gets confusing and sort of falls down. Because that yeah. VNet one is your your VNet. Yeah, so when I passed that value in before, oh, you know what? Let me let me check in here and see if we're still take because I changed it in here too. I think. Same being that VM name. Yeah, there. Do we have six? So that's a good point, too, is if we have a parameter listed in our parameter file that is not listed in our template, it's going to fail and say, hey, you provided a parameter that doesn't exist. If we are missing a parameter, it will do things like this, or it will fail and say, hey, you didn't provide a parameter that is asked for in your template file. So your parameter file parameters should match up with um, your template parameters. But remember, these two parameters we're actually providing as optional parameters in the PowerShell commandlet. So we don't need to put those in the parameter file. So I'm looking at the actual template that I built too. So let's see, VM same thing. Okay. And I'm going to go ahead and change this now. Yeah, no, that that is right. It's the VM name. Sorry. Yeah. See, I, I confused myself. And I'm going to go ahead and change this since we already have a VM. Yep. And I I think that's possibly what the issue is completely. So, yeah, so it's like it's changing that VM um, as right. it already exists, but it's. This one that is already exists there, I think maybe the name was provided. Yep, it was. So that's what that's what shows up in the parameters file, VM dash same dash VNet. Yeah. So, so that's what we were that's what we were adjusting and changing when we were running into all those errors. This will be fun to watch. If somebody's watching this, God bless you for watching the entire bit. We are speeding all of this stuff up. Yes. And so that that makes me also wonder. Let's go back down and look at this template and see what the name of the network we're referencing in our NIC is. It'll, it'll be in the variables. Okay. That's how the VM same, same, uh, that's how the IP address shows up in the same. The IP address is there and the yeah. 
subnet right. reference is VM same VNet subnet reference, which is variables. Okay, so VNet ID. Yep, and the so the VNet ID is taking it from virtual network name. Gotcha. It's not and, that VNet name. Yeah, okay, correct. Yeah, so that's okay. that's one hundred percent the issue. So it's we confused ourselves based upon my naming convention when I was trying to do this all quick and dirty. Yep. It's it's my fault, Matt. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, it happens. It happens. There was some confusion. So let's just name our VM something else. Let's just call it. Let's just call it DJ Shane VM1. Yep, that works. Okay, we're going to leave our super secret password that everybody can see on the screen. And let's go ahead and try to deploy this bad boy again. Okay, we got our files uploading. So we got our valid template. And we must be really good with, oh no, here we go again. The template parameter is not found. Oh, because maybe we didn't change it. It's, it's looking for the old one. So it's still looking for this somewhere. Yeah. So this is just complaining about that. At line 67. Oh, this is looking for this one. So this line 67, it's referring to this deployment in the main template. And okay. VM same VNet name, VM name. There it is. All right, so if, if we do this, then maybe what we can do with the tail end of the, the this video is talk about sort of you know, some of the next upcoming sessions we want to do. So, but before before we do that, we, we cross our fingers, right? But don't cross your crossed fingers. Oh, yeah, no, that would be bad. It's like crossing the stream, right? Right. From Ghostbusters. Yep, a double negative yeah. or, or a double positive. Okay, we got a valid template again for now. Oh, and now our DNS. Okay, so remember we changed that DNS record before. Um, it's our DNS for our public IP. Do you want to just remove it from the portal? Because I think it's there, isn't it? Nope, I'm just going to change the DNS name here, and we'll call it two. Works for me. Yeah, I was gonna say, don't forget to save it. <laughs> right. I did, the, I did the control S. Yeah. Short keep, keyboard shortcuts. All right, so it looks like it provisioned the network interface. Oh, oh no, we get we got a problem with our oh the VM size. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty straightforward. We could we could easily fix that. D two V two. I it must be D two underscore. Is it D two underscore V two? I bet. I just flubbed up the. Let's see. I bet it's this, but yeah, it's it's standard underscore d two underscore v two. I bet you that's. Yeah. I had that all run together. Okay, control s one more time. No worries, no worries. We're slowly getting there. Hopefully, people are realizing now that. Yep, it's an iteration. Um, yep, yeah, it's it's iterative. And one of the great things about this too is that you will notice I keep deploying this same. Uh, template over and over and over again and you may notice in here that things get built right like the the public ip is there now the nic is there now right we got we got a couple of different nics um and it's gonna 
deploy over the top and it's going to see, oh, the NIC is already created, so I don't have to create it because it already is there based on what it looks like in this file. So we got another bit of red text. So what is it not like now? I love how it pushes this um, error message all the way over to the side here. I think it's because you, um, uh, I don't know what the right term is, but when you sort of unmaximized it, I think that's when you got the error message. It's trying to reuse our disk blob. So our disk. So we can just. So this might be a good time to just make that a. Uh, Manage disk. Let's do it. Yeah. So let's go down to our VM here. And we let's see, our disk is in here in our storage profile, right? OS disk name. If you want, you can you can pull up the ARM template reference for a managed disk. Yes. Yep. And I will do that. But let's change this name also because it's hard coded again, right? And so it's going to take on the same thing every time you deploy it. So this, we want our parameters and we want our VM name, right? Uh, VM same VNet being VM name. Okay, but here we're gonna go ahead and concatenate this with dash, oh, dash OS disk. And let's end our parenthesis there. So now our VM name, our VM is going to get a disk with the same name as a VM except dash OS disk. And then let's do this. Okay, let's let's go ahead and go consult with the documentation. Yeah, that, that we've linked to. We linked to a couple of episodes back. Yeah. And I do try to save that in my favorites. So I have a infra as code set of favorites here and Azure Resource Manager template reference, which is this nice, this nice reference of, okay, what are you creating? So we're going to go look for, again, our Microsoft.compute. And then we're going to look for our virtual machines. And we are going to check what the, oh, and look, it comes up with Bicep as default now. Yeah, which is awesome. So one of the things we're going to do in a future session is talk about converting your ARM templates to Bicep or starting with Bicep because sometimes folks didn't embrace ARM templates. And so it's an opportunity to embrace something. It just basically compiles it to an ARM template at runtime. Yep. So the ARM execution Absolutely. engine is still the ARM execution engine. It's been, always been, it's just less code. And it's probably less of what we're what you're seeing right now. So we're sort of going through and picking apart the template that's what folks who've been coding ARM templates wind up doing. They sort of get in these weird squirrely issues and they've got to sort of fix it. Yep, exactly. And so here you'll notice how much stuff is in this template reference, right? This, yep. this, this is for a, a VM and this is kind of pretty much a lot of options that you don't necessarily um, have to put in there, right? These are not all required. And if you go down and, and look, um, down here, you can see, you know, the values that are kind of accepted for those different properties. So what we want to do first is we want to come up here and we want to find our uh, OS disk. And there is, um, this is a storage profile, right? And there's another storage profile that was listed in here as well. Um, here's your OS profile. Oh, that's the OS profile is the other one. Um, so you have your OS profile, right? This says, you know, do I want Windows or Linux? And here's a Linux configuration. There's probably, yeah, here's a Windows configuration if you're taking a Windows machine, right? So you're not going to pick both of those. You'll pick one or one or the other of those. But we want to come down here to our storage profile, and we're looking at um, OS disk, right? So we want this section, right? Yep. And we want to say look at the managed disk section, right? Yeah, I think, I think that's all you really need to get this up and functional, Matt, is just the managed disk section. Because everything yep. else, sort of, it, that, that's if you needed to 
encrypt your disk, right? You, you can encrypt your disk at runtime. Yeah. So let's pull this up and then let's have our, our VM template on the other side of the screen. And so we're down. Oh, let's see. I think if you just click on that, yeah, like that. There you go. Yeah. Um, okay. So we have OS disk here and then we have the VHD property and that is, uh, let's see, this is probably where we want to replace this, right? I can, so double, check. I can double check one of my templates to make sure. Yeah, CVHD. Uh, so manage disk is here and then, then you have name, OS type, VHD right here for the Yep. Not manage disk one. So yep, and then so the so you'll want to put the uh, like the storage account type, which is yeah, standard underscore LRS or or GRS or whatever, right? Yep. 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 So okay, so let's just I think we can just do this, and then we'll get rid of the VHD part here in a second. Right. Look at that. We're getting we're, we're making this a more modern template over the course of these episodes. OK, so we want managed disk and then um, we don't need the disk encryption set, right? We just need the storage account type. Yeah, not not for this template, but um, we could add that in if we have time on the security one, you know, Key Vault, right? Thinking about encrypting a disk with an, an encryption key that you store in Key Vault, right? Right, right. So here I'm just going to pull out the VHD part. And then let's see, this looks like it's complaining about something. Oh, do you need to give it a type? Hang on, what do I have? So it wants the VHD part, but I'm wondering. Oh, you need to use a different, you need a different um, schema. API. Or, right? Sorry, API. Yes, yes. That's, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So let's. Yeah, this is up. a this is a fairly old one. Yeah. Um, you could try. Let's I'm just right now. You could try 2017-03-30. You could even go earlier than that or newer than that, but that one I know will work. See, and now now that we've switched the API version. We'll come back down here and look. This is all happy now. It's not. It's not complete. The API was uh, before managed disks, and yep. now the API we're using, which we've talked about, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's a good point to reiterate: is if you're trying to use a property and you keep getting these IntelliSense errors, saying, "Hey, you know, this property is not available," blah blah blah. Check the API version because the API version dictates, and you'll see this, in, and I'll show you here in the documentation too. Um, you'll see in the documentation where you see at the top. API version here is the latest. If we go back to what was it, uh, 2023, was it, or 17, 2017, 330? Yeah. If we click there, then you won't have necessarily all these properties that you saw in the previous one. See where it's, it's much, you know, further slimmed down. So we can just double check this and look at our, our uh, storage profile here, data disk, OS disk right here, and then see, Manage disk. It just takes an an ID and a storage account type, right? Um, and the ID is actually going to be generated for us. We don't we don't have to put that in there. So we just modernized our template. Let's go ahead and save it. We don't have to worry now about that whole disk reuse thing. And the reason why, if you're not as familiar with managed disk, is it's a disk. Like so, you just basically say. I need a VM. I need a disk. Microsoft will manage that disk for you. Prior to managed disks, it was, they were called unmanaged disks, and they all had different URIs, which was reliant upon everything being different. 
because you, storage, storage accounts always required that different URI. Yeah, and here's the biggest the, here's the biggest difference, and the biggest reason why you want to go with managed storage accounts is when you have unmanaged storage accounts, right? So the, the base are basically you're managing the storage account. The disk performance that you get in your VM. So if you're deploying, say, you know, 50 VMs, you can't shove all of those OS disks in the same storage account because you only get a certain number of IOPS out of that storage account. Correct. And your disks are taking 500 IOPS, you know, if they're just standard, not premium, you know, uh, yeah. SSD disks, those those standard spinning disks are taking 500 IOPS per disk. And the maximum the maximum IOPS for a storage account, at least at that point, was 2000 IOPS, right? So think about that. That's 40 disks that you can put in the same storage account. And those being the only things running in there, before you start hitting performance problems, your disks can't perform to the 500 IOPS that you're kind of promised with a disk. Right. So, so Microsoft said, okay, well, let's do this because this is such a pain for our customers. Let's let's give them, um, uh, you know, a managed disk, which means Microsoft manages the storage account in the background, um, and and therefore, you know, they have some automation running to say, oh, okay, look at the look at the IOPS and the performance of how many disks we already have in this storage account. Right. So your disk is now separated from other disks on this on machines that you're creating. So if we were to do some sort of copy loop here and want to create 100 machines, we know that using managed disks, Microsoft's going to take care of creating that in the background. All we have to say is we need 100 disks. We don't we don't have to say, oh, yeah, we got to think about how many storage accounts we're using here, et cetera, et cetera. Right. So it becomes like a big logistical nightmare if you're deploying more than 40 machines at a time because they can't all go into the same storage account. Yeah. But that that's the big thing with managed disks. And that's why you want to go to it. And, yeah. it's and all, so, that extra, all, all that extra math you don't have to account for when you're using a managed disk. Right. Exactly. And so we just modernized this. So because we're deploying a onesie and twosie, how many of you are really going to do that? So we'll show you this managed disk thing, and hopefully now that will clear up our error as well. <clears throat> so now we're deploying again. Checking our status in five. Okay. Property change not allowed. Did the VM start? The creating? VM created, and now since we yeah, changed, so just, yeah, just just delete it in the portal. Yep, that's that's what we shall do. All right, let's refresh our resources here. Make sure we got it. Okay, yeah, DJ yeah, Shan VM one. Yep, yep, it did get created. And I, I refresh, you notice that I just quick went up and refreshed the page because how many times have you wanted to refresh this and something doesn't refresh properly? So this machine is you there. You could just delete anything that has DJ Shan in it and then rerun it. It might make things, e yeah, see, it shows up as failed. Yeah. So that's the failed provisioning, but the machine object is still there. So we've got to get rid of it because there that, that property, which is the OS disk name, can't be changed after the machine is created. Yep. So, um, uh, we actually just just try deleting the VM and then we'll rerun it. Yeah. Don't don't no no don't delete the resource group. Oh no, that was a yeah. I hit the wrong delete, didn't I? Yeah, I do the same thing. It's closer to the right. Or yeah, you can do that too. Yes. Confirm. Now I can't go back and blame Microsoft for my accidental deletion. <laughs> Would you do that though? Mm -mm. You, you work oh my gosh you took a drink of your water and your water you you couldn't see the the, the mug it literally looked like did you see that do that i, yeah, I did not i did not see oh, that but... that's, <laughs> that's a tail that and i just blocked out my face awesome. that is awesome it's green that's why. oh that's why okay. it is totally green i didn't even think about that but it's a different shade of green you would think I think I think it's so long as you've got chroma key on and it's green. No, I'm drinking the uh, I'm drinking the predator, right? Isn't that like his cloaking? You can kind of okay. see it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, so now that that is gone, oh, did we get? Let's make sure we got a confirmation there. Yep. Executed delete command. That's great. 
So now let's go ahead and hit our handy dandy up arrow. Now that we're recreating the machine and not changing a property. Yeah. That also showcases that there are certain things you can change or certain things you can't change. Um, and that's just something you just determine over the course of time of dealing with templated deployments, right? Right. Right. And there, there's always the delete and recreate option. And and so this is one of the, the reasons why you want to have infrastructure as code, because, you know, there there were I remember, um, you know, starting out with Azure, you couldn't you couldn't. Um, well, even before before resource manager, the NIC was part of the VM. Right. Yep. So you couldn't create multiple NICs because it. it there wasn't, there was this whole, the NIC is part of the VM, yep. you know, dependency type of thing. Now, you know, we have multiple NICs that you can attach or unattach from a VM, right? And so having having your um, infrastructure laid out in code and making your changes there and, and deploying code in those cases where you have to say, oh, how was this machine built the rest of the way? You know, what, what were my other options? Because I have to delete this machine and, and Created again to you know, what change the disk or or change yeah. certain things. It deployed, and, Matt. After all of that, look at that. This is why Matt's the whiz in our, the ARM template world. Uh, yeah, but that only gets said after the successful part, right? When there's red <laughs> showing up, you know, Matt's not the whiz yet. Well, but Matt, you figured it out, and it was a combination of both of us sort of identifying the nuances of what happens when you just right click and you add a resource in Visual Studio, right? So. Yep. So maybe what we've shown learners is maybe they don't even want to deal with Visual Studio, right? So it just, there's nuances, there's things you have to factor in if you're going from different IDEs, right? You could even think about using something like Atom or I've heard of people using straight Vim, uh, JSON editing JSON files via Vim. And I'm like, y'all are nuts. So yeah. there, there's, there's things you have to factor in if you're taking your code from different IDEs and um, so either you followed us, you followed along, or either you just sort of watched it and you sort of got some ideas on the direction. But I think you saw Matt was able to sort of persevere. Yeah. And so that, that's a good point, too, with Visual Studio. And then, and then one of the things that we kind of show people is if you want a quick start on, say, a, a resource group, you can create these by hand. And then you can come in here and you can go to export template to get a template for this, but you're going to run into some of the similar problems as with Visual Studio is that, you know, this automated uh, writing of code may or may not have parameterized the things you want to parameterize, may or may not have named the parameters properly, right? Well, um, and, then, and then there's there's a, there's three resource types that can't be exported. So if you click on that at the very top, the... Um, Oh, yeah, this is, message. This yeah. Message. So what is it? Virtual machine extension for monitoring. Oh, monitoring which I, think, I think that that's, that must be being pushed via like policy. Yeah. And then storage yeah, account inventory policies. Um, and then, yeah, the qual, the Qualys agent. Which now folks are seeing, we get policies pushed to us when we're on the Microsoft subscription, right? So. Yes, we do. Um, I just didn't know if it was one of the resources you deployed. I couldn't think why it, why it wouldn't show up, but. Right. But, but I mean, look at the name of the parameters now. Um, so your parameter name for your virtual network name is now virtual networks VNet one underscore name, right? Because yep. it takes the name of that VNet and adds it as the name of the parameter, which I don't like because that is not, that is not really like, you can't look at that and say, oh yeah, that's just the VNet name, right? And right. virtual machines, DJ Shan VM one name, right? Why don't you just say virtual machine name? Yep. Yeah. So I, th I think there's, there's refactoring at any step of the way. Uh, doesn't matter if you're straight going the bicep route, there's refactoring. You're going to have to factor in. Uh, exactly. Exactly. And so um, what I like to tell people is if you really have this complex deployment in a resource group and you want to do this, you can go ahead and do this and that will get you a lot of code written. That'll, that'll keep you from having to know like what order all these properties have to go in and where and things like that. 
and what properties that you need, but it's it, you're going to have some work to do when you're done, when you export this, and then you could open it in Visual Studio Code or Notepad++ or Vim if, you, if you're crazy like that. I, that. That was a customer. When we were on the same team, I, I went out and this customer told me that he does all of his development on a Linux VM and he uses Vim. And I was like, you're crazy, but I appreciate you because I couldn't do it, right? <laughs> Right, right. And and so there's some things too to be said, like, you know, about doing it by hand. I, I have mad respect for those people because you have to know the commands. Like if you're writing if you're writing code like a uh, managed code like C sharp or something like that, you have to know the commands to go in there and run the compiler, right? Run the checks on the compiler and all that type of stuff by hand. If you're if you don't have an IDE like Visual Studio where you can click a button that says compile, right? right. So right. Uh, those those guys are old school and have have some mad skills and they know and they know what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll 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 kind of I'll kind of uh, preface that with like <clears throat> IDEs can save you so much time. I think so. Yeah. When when I was a developer of a technology to be unnamed, there was this way. <laughs> <laughs> there was this way of deploying packages to SharePoint, right? Okay. And it was a WSP file. Uh, so you would write all the code and then before the nice little IDE plugins came out to package that up into a WSP, you basically had to write by hand a manifest file and then put that into it with your code into a zip file and then rename that zip file .wsp, right? So yeah. if you've done any, if you, if you've, you know, know anything about SharePoint, you can actually go and grab a WSP file, rename it to zip and break that open and see all of the files that are are being deployed to the the server in there but before the tool came out it took more just as much if not more time to write that manifest file and do all the packaging of the code that you wrote as it did to write the code right so yeah. here you are like writing all this code trying to be productive and now you're doubling the time that it takes for you to get something deployable because now you have to write all this stuff and and package it all up right well then there was this whole a uh, little Visual Studio um, extension that somebody wrote that said, you know, right click and make the WSP uh, package for you. And that was like a two minute thing. So for IDEs and, and things like that, you know, it just goes to show you that automating some of those things can save you a world of trouble. And, and, and you know, granted that when you know what you're doing, if one of those package type things fails and you know what it's supposed to be doing you can go in and, and you know try to troubleshoot where it failed and see what it did wrong because maybe this was a one-off case so it does pay to know that stuff but but it saves you so much time to to use your ides and your and your um uh you know your little uh, quick tools and extensions and things like that um just like with you know with uh visual studio code here having these lines that say hey something's wrong here and this because we deleted vhds um and, and we went to manage disks this stuff is now unneeded and so this is telling me hey you don't need this anymore you've got extra stuff yeah. in your template that's just causing maybe confusion or whatever right so then you can go in and delete that stuff so um ides do have a lot to be said for them well and i think um coming from the infrastructure background ides always helped me related to formulating what i was building right so you know, think of it as sort of the the cheat sheet. And I think a lot of us don't want to roll everything from scratch. We don't have time. Everybody's you know, moving too quickly. Technology is changing too quickly, right? So the IDs are, are super helpful. And uh, hopefully you've seen exactly how Matt's been able to sort of take the template that I originally created in Visual Studio. I ran into problems with that, right? But we troubleshot it. The video's published. And then I gave that file to Matt and we've sort of made a handful of videos that you can sort of watch and digest uh, you know, at a time that makes sense. We've sped up the areas that aren't as relevant, meaning he's copying and pasting things around. But I hopefully you get an idea on nested templates, how you can make use of nested templates. And then you've got a modular way to update certain components in one template versus having to go to hundred, hundreds and hundreds of line template to fix whatever you have to fix so you can redeploy for a new environment. Yes. And so, so um, the next thing is that we're going to do, right? We're going to maybe look at some bicep or. Yeah, so we definitely are going to look at some bicep. We definitely are going to talk about Key Vault. Uh, we need to, yeah. we need to talk about Key Vault. We need to talk about 
DSC. Yep. And so I think those are some of the last remaining videos in the series. And Matt and I are going to work out a schedule to get some of this out uh, faster now that we're both back in the office. That was the delay over the summer. Plus, I got really busy. So, you know, it's it's a labor of love, right? You get busy. You don't have enough time to do the same level of, uh, of publishing these videos. So hopefully you're finding it enjoyable. Definitely feel free to like, share, subscribe. And, and I guess just let us know if there's anything else you'd like us to cover. But I think we've got, you know, DSC, Key Vault, and then we'll do a couple of, uh, probably a couple of episodes on Bicep, wouldn't you think? Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's there's quite a bit that we can go through on Bicep. And maybe we'll take this template that you're already familiar with and change the username and password to come from Key Vault. That might be our next uh iteration right so at least if you're following along and you have your own templates that you're creating or whatever and you say okay now i've gone by what they've said now how do i do this whole key vault thing because i don't want to keep my password in a parameter file right right or, or provide like you can leave that you can leave that parameter out as well and have um have the ide or or uh, powershell prompt you for that and then it goes in because it sees it as a secure string yep. it goes in dot you know you see dot 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 on the screen um so you can do you can do things like that as well but we want you to do this with key vault so this way um you know we don't have no any chance of doing something naughty and and maybe committing something right. to, to, to a repository with secrets or right. things like that so um i think you know and and using a template that you're familiar with will be great because if you're following along and building along then you'll know where to go in your own template and change things and what to change what to add what to take out and that type of stuff very cool so stay tuned we've got more content for you and our goal here is to sort of take that temple that we've been building or the environment that we've sort of been tracking and have a, a series of, of templates and i think at the end of the series we'll have a github repo and maybe what i'll do is i'll go and I'll edit all the show notes so that you can kind of go to that GitHub repo after each video and take a look at the code. That's great. So, all right. Well, with that, thanks for tuning in. We'll have more content soon. Thanks, Matt, for figuring all this out. Uh, definitely wasn't an easy process. And stay tuned for more. Thank you.